here we're returning to animals uh, in general. This is thanks in part to AnAge. This is an animal aging database that uh, Pedro de Magalas established as a postdoc in my lab. These are two of our first papers together. Um, and it still is, it, it's just been updated now to 4,600 species of animals. It has all kinds of information with a heavy slant towards aging. Uh, and what we have is a, a variety of animals. I think as we get closer to human in the lower right, uh, we, we, uh, we get to more realistic uh, um, models for human. It doesn't necessarily mean that we can't get into these infinite lifespans, although de-differentiating into a small embryonic-like state is probably not practical for a complex nervous system. Um, here, uh, here we have organisms that are so low metabolism that you can actually do carbon-14 dating of them to get an estimate. But but the bowhead whale and the rat have, have you know, relatively similar metab metabolic rates to us and to each other. And and you can see this is built into their DNA. So I would argue that a lot of this, they have fundamentally different genomes. And if we just merely administered the best small molecules we'll come up with in pharma pharmaceuticals and nutritional study and so forth, it's not going to make the giant thunder rat live as long as a bowhead whale. We have to focus on the genomes and its, and its effects. Now we can focus on the genome in two ways gene therapy and germline uh, engineering. Now you might say germline's off the table because of ethical reasons. Well, yes and no, and we'll get to that in a second. So for somatic, the advantages are shorter clinical trials, um, and, and most importantly, 8 billion of us are already past the point, well past the point, where, where germline would be appropriate uh, therapeutic for us. So I think this makes it completely, these two things make it quite impractical uh, for most of us, of uh, the market, so to speak. Um, germline does have advantages, though. You get delivery to all tissues, which is which we're addressing that challenge of getting to all tissues with various delivery methods that I'll come to in a second. But um, it's a, it, germline definitely solves it. It has a million-fold lower off-target. I hardly ever see this mentioned, but it's because you're clonally introducing a single cell um, rather than doing um, therapeutics on mil billions of cells at once. Now, we can get germline into human without ethical pro without the usual ethical problems of germline by doing transplants and cell therapies. These are applicable to children and adults that are already born. So why gene and cell therapies rather than small molecules? I already alluded to this a little bit. But they are challenged in discriminating multi-gene families, proteins that are related to each other evolutionarily in the genome, and to splice isoforms, which are epigenetically uh, diverse. But they have very similar active sites, which small molecules bind to. Uh, gene therapies uh, are typically once and done, or at least that's one of the advantages, rather than a lifetime of daily dose, where you're missing your dose could uh, be catastrophic. Um, and gene therapy is directly connected to mechanism. So when we make a discovery, it's often framed in terms of a particular pathway, a particular gene, a particular protein, and you can immediately, and we did this, we, we took uh, 45 um, observations from literature, turned them into 45 gene therapies in a couple of months when Noah Davison was a postdoc in my lab. Okay, so we have these incredible exponential progress curves of, you know, base pairs per dollar for both reading and writing genomes. But what about therapeutics? Okay, what have we done, to, what have we done recently? Uh, these, these are, I, I should mention, going faster than Moore's law, and there's no law here, it's just observation that we, we live in exponential uh, technologies. Um, here's two examples that impact delivery of the therapeutic, of the gene therapies, Helix Nano 164X. Um, So, we have done something about therapy, uh, gene therapies and, and delivery. Uh, we speaking broadly here. Um, the rare diseases are still in the range of two million to three and a half million dollars per dose, making the most expensive in history therapies. 
but that's because probably mostly because of the rare. If you look at common diseases that are addressed by formulations that are uh, you know, production sense almost identical to um, uh, to gene therapies, we get uh, two dollars a dose instead of two million dollars a dose. And so, for example, here's three companies that produced uh, adenoviral capsules delivering double strand DNA for COVID-19, and two companies lipid nanoparticles delivering messenger RNA single gene for the spike protein. And, and this has now been tested on billions of people with good outcomes. Um, who knows how much less the seven billion dollar uh, excess deaths would have been if we had had these on day one of COVID, and and people taking it. By the way, <laughs> so part of that delivery is getting better. So I mentioned both viral and non-viral uh, delivery. Um, we can improve the, both the delivery and the payload. Now we have ex exceptional. Um, machine learning tools for proteins, nucleic acids, and cells, um, and, and delivery vehicles. Um, and we combine this machine learning with mega libraries. These are libraries of a million or more designed components. These are not randomized proteins. These are designed in a particular segment. And we can, we can now get up to 100% substitution of new amino acids. So, that, so we no longer are restricted to maybe on the order of a few percent change. This, uh, here's an Eric uh, published Science and Nature Biotech papers on this. And here's an example of a heat map. We have all possible amino acids on the y-axis and all the positions along the genome on the x-axis and various, uh, this is just a subset of the tissues you can look at. And here's their, their first really big success uh, in a product, which is called BCAP1, which is beats by by far the previous best uh, delivery, um, natural capsid delivery to the brain. This covers, it delivers all over the brain very effectively and specifically. So, so a quick uh, drill down onto um, what we can do for multiplex uh, engineering of enhancements, cell enhancements, in principle gene therapy and organs. This is how you can get um, germline in, from animals into humans. So um, the, for cold and dehydration, the champion here, champions are the Siberian salamander, uh, which can make it a minus 55 for, for over a month. Um, here's a midge that uses trehalose to survive, uh, very low water, high radiation. Um, and then we'll talk about immunity, cancer, senescence as well. And pathogens, a lot of, as I pointed out, many of these animals are naturally resistant to a lot of human-specific pathogens. You may know that there are many organisms that are highly radiation resistant, maybe five orders of magnitude. What you may not know is that you can convert uh, a very sensitive organism to a very resistant one with as few as four genes. And here's a paper that describes that. And we're pursuing this in, um, in human cells. Uh, we have uh, two uh, slides here on immune, uh, avoiding immune rejection, both autoimmune and uh, allo and zeno. And it's not, it's not something where you just have one edit to the genome and you're done. We needed 69 edits to get the, the ones that are doing the best in our preclinical pre trials. They're surviving for two years, uh, these organ transplants into non-human primates, and, the, and, and you can see uh, a few articles on using um, people that are um, um, that are uh, decedent uh, models that are, that are brain dead that are their last great contribution to humanity is is uh, being is testing with these uh, organs transplants. So you know, two years and and better. Um, there, this the edits include sugars, which are extreme rejection. Um, there's clotting incompatibilities, complement, uh, major histopathy, which is the main um, things that are used for matching human-human uh, -human transplants, endogenous retroviruses, and so forth. A series of these papers initiated by Lu Han Yang, who was a graduate student, postdoc, and co-founder with me of eugenesis. Uh, a second example of uh, resisting now autoimmunity is we can, in 
animals that are genetically programmed to autoimmune uh, uh, demyelination in their brain can be rescued by human organoids that not only replace the, the damaged ligodendrocytes, but also um, are enhanced and they're resistant to the original autoimmunity via cytokine tricks and things like that. Alex and Paris do, I have to thank for this Nature Biotech paper and they co-founded uh, GC Therapeutics to do this sort of thing. Um, we have been dreaming of a way of making any cell resistant or any organism resistant to all viruses. And just this year, we achieved that dream in one case, uh, an industrial microorganism, um, where we, re we did a serine to leucine swap, two codons out of 64 triplet codons. Serine and leucine are wildly different chemically. And if you do that swap, in a way that doesn't hurt the host cells, um, but all viruses need these two codons in every uh, protein. So they're broken in so many ways they can't uh, escape. And this is true not only for viruses, but the dozens of viruses that are already studied in this organism, but we went out and got dozens more from um, farm waste and sewage and so forth and showed could find no sh shred of evidence of any leak through of any of these viruses. This is thanks to Akko, Spena, and Reagan published in Nature just this year. We want, we're now uh, adjusting, uh, applying this to mammalian species of both ag agricultural um, conservation, endangered species, and human health. So, uh, Pathways of aging. I believe we need to get all of these right. It's not sufficient to get a few of them right, like caloric restriction or telomeres or, uh, you know, stem cells. You really have to get them all right. Uh, I've included cancer here as, as one of these that you have to get right. If you just get one of them right, you might uh, average add average of two years to our lifespan. If we're talking about extreme longevity, that's just a thimble into the ocean. Um, so, so how do we get, how do we try to get all of them right? But behind that kind of thematic circle of 10 uh, hallmarks, there's deep biochemistry for all the pathways involved in those 10 themes. And we can, uh, we, we're not claiming we know everything, but we might know enough to, to, to start the engineering, which, we, which is well started. Now I'm gonna show a, 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 a version of the slide in just a second where I've highlighted with three colors, three primary colors, uh, three pathways that are uh, extracellular and hence are available to the blood. So you know about uh, um, parabiosis uh, and, and interesting experiments there. Um, we wanted to do those with defined factors. Uh, these are blood-borne factors. So here they are. Um, the fibroblast growth factor 21, alpha clotho uh, are naturally secreted and the, the receptor for TGF-beta can be modified to be a soluble form. So we now have three soluble blood-borne moieties so that your delivery by gene therapy can be um, modest in, uh, in its efficiency, but then it gets amplified by this producing of proteins and secretion. So these, we try these uh, individually. This is part of the screen of 45 gene therapies I've talked about. These were the winners tried them all possible combinations, we being Noah Davidson and his team uh, in, in this PNS paper. And here's some of the primary data showing uh, three different uh, age-related disease um, tests. Uh, this one is uh, for um, diet-induced obesity, where the, the, the best treatments at the bottom here lower the weight uh, quickly over a period of days and then plateau at the correct weight rather than going too far. Um, to anorexia. Here's a diabetes model where we get insulin tolerance uh, and a kidney model where we get um, recovery, um, sort of youthful recovery of um, urethral uh, obstruction. So we focused on initially four and eventually seven and eight different um, age-related diseases rather than biomarkers uh, because uh, if we can get multiple or all of these with with some combination, uh, 
therapy. So combination therapies, I think, are growing in interest, both for infectious cancer and now aging. Um, and so we have a total of eight genes in these four studies that are published, um, two of them in, in, in combinations of three genes at once. Again, Noah Davidson was co-author on most of these papers and started Rejuvenate Bio, which is now um, completing uh, clinical trials on dogs and starting clinical trials on humans very soon. Um, so these have these these are all viral vectors A, V, uh, or C and V. And so, to really qualify for uh, longevity rather than mere aging reversal, aging reversal is faster. You can measure it sometimes in weeks. Uh, see the physiology and anatomy changing. Uh, but to get longevity, you have to do these survival curves. And here's showing. Uh, a very significant improvement with the blue lines being shift, shifted to the right relative to the control on the left, um, where we have um, doxycycline induced uh, Yamanaka factors, three of the four Yamanaka factors. Now, what's interesting, and, and, and we need to step out away from this a little bit, um, is that this trial was started very late in life, uh, so late in life that more than half, half of the healthy, normally aging mice had died before the, the, the um, therapy was administered. But even at that late an age, we still see a significant improvement. So this is not something you need in your germline or even uh, in childhood. This is the sort of thing we're looking for, which can help the bulk of humanity that's immediately facing age-related diseases. Here's another example. From a different company, last to rejuvenate. This was BioViva. I think you saw um, a presentation on this earlier. Here's the control on the on the left, and two different gene therapies showing significant uh, improvement in survival on the right, 41 and 32 percent. And I'm just going to wrap up by saying um, that there are s s some things that affect so much of the genome that you need, um, you might need remarkable editing capabilities, which I'll show you in a second. So, for example, these are uh, uh, repetitive elements, the long interspersed or line elements, the, the short ones are sign, ribosomal, got to put centromeres in here. We're also working with which are involved in senescence in these different uh, uh, papers, literature. One approach is the one that uh, one of my companies, Transposon Therapeutics, has taken, um, where repurposing drugs aimed at HIV um, that happen to have a particularly good um, influence preventing hopping around of the, the line elements. And here's uh, our our champion for multiplex editing. We we now uh, tackled uh, all, getting all the line elements. Um, 24,000 of them with uh, an A to G deaminase. We found that essentially every other editing method was too um, toxic, uh, either because you had a uricyclicosis problem or a mismatch repair problem. We had to put in antiepileptic molecules, growth matches. Anyway, if you do everything right, you can you can get very high editing levels, up to 24,000 per cell. Uh, you can even do multiple rounds if necessary to really clean, clean it up. All the ones that are accessible and capable of, in this case, um, expressing the risk transcriptase and hopping in the genome and landing in places they to longevity in the current and near future. Uh, periods will stop, thank you.